I messaged Hayden, Hayden, um, just saying if you want to make a Harakiki rally car. Why did you do that? Oh, I just thought it'd be cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would show the like vibration, energy, absorption properties of Harakiki. So like rally cars go through a lot. We're using Harakiki and composite textiles to replace carbon fibre and fibreglass, which have significant environmental, human and technical challenges associated with them. Oh, it's many markets all worth trillions of dollars because pretty much everything starts with a textile. Will and I are working on a waste materials assignment because tococa leaves or cabbage tree leaves couldn't go into the green bin in New Zealand because it's too strong for the machines and yeah. we learnt that harakiki was exactly the same. And then we realised that these natural fibres have the potential to be used in engineering applications and that got us really excited about all the different use cases that you could do with it. You could make this out of it, you could make that out of it. <laughs> make surfboards, skis, snowboards. So this is probably the first like prototype that we made, which was made on a barbecue in Will's student flat. It's got a quite a cool finish, you can see the fibre and stuff. So this is the road version of Hayden's EV rally car with the Harakiki front bumper. So this is half the weight of the original bumper. Wow, it's half the weight. Half the weight of the original bumper. Then it was basically going, okay, what market are we going to focus on? What kinds of products are we going to make our bread and butter? And if it's good enough for a rally car, it's good enough for sports equipment. <laughs> so pickleball's one of the fastest growing sports in the world. It's kind of like tennis. So this is a kiwi fibre pickleball paddle. And this is That's a, a plastic one. Yeah, they sound different because natural fibres, harakiki, dampens the energy and the shock from the ball. So um, all that energy is dissipated through the fibres, where, whereas in that one, it all goes through into Will's wrist. We are near Lake Waihora and we're on a farm that has a lot of good stuff happening on it. We're going to see some harvesting <laughs> of the harakeke plant, so the specific way in which it is harvested um, under tikanga. Māori have used this fibre for centuries in bags, tools, locker, everything. It was the plant of life. It gave medicines because the gels and the oils have antiseptic properties for ronga medicine. That's my great-grandfather, William Templeton, who uh, got the flax mill going in this spot. Look at how much there is. Yeah, there was 40 acres. Uh, I'm Vaughan Templeton, and I'm the curator of the uh, museum we run here at Riverton. Wow, oh, this is the only flax mill left in New Zealand or the world. If operating on an original site, this is the only one. Flax milling was one of New Zealand's biggest industries peaked in the 1890s. It was New Zealand's largest export by volume. Bigger than butter, bigger than wool, bigger than timber. Howard's taking the fibre off the chain, making it into a hank and putting it over the pole, and it's all the time being washed by all that water, trying to get as much vegetation off as we can. He's getting pretty wet. Oh, he's not bad. Those leggings are almost waterproof. <laughs> The English Navy were the earliest customer. It boomed before the First World War and during the First World War, but after that, you know, New Zealand's wages got quite high. This is a labour intensive industry. And so with New Zealand's wages getting high, uh, cheaper imported fibres became more economic. Plus, you know, we had the invention of the, the petrol and diesel engines, so our need for ropes became a lot less. Harakeke is special in the way that it grows in a whanau structure. It's got the tipuna, the risho and the afarito. Um, so we're only harvesting the tipuna leaves, or the grandparent leaves, which are the outside leaves. So the way they did it is they planted this by the row, like they did with, you know, wine or apples or whatever. And then they'd harvest it by the row and they'd cut away the entire thing against all tikanga 
It would take eight years for the plant to grow back properly until you can harvest it again. And then that led to, you know, poor financial returns as well because it took so long to grow back. And harakeke is special as well because it actually wicks away contaminants and disease to the outside leaves. Um, so by harvesting and by pruning just the outside leaves, you're allowing more prosperous growth of the inside leaves and therefore the plant. And then it grows back quicker. It's really cool to do it like a traditional way, like doing something that's been done for so long. Hard work? Yeah, good work. Over the next few years, we'll be engaging in a lot more planting, but we're really proposing sustainable transition of land use, where the land that doesn't want to be or can't or shouldn't be farmed on under traditional agricultural practices um, adopts new ideas, new business models and new plants. There's so many macro tailwinds supporting this as well because the problem that linen and hemp have globally is that they have to be planted on food producing land and so therefore you can either plant hemp or you can plant food. And that's the last thing we want to do. We don't want to be taking land away from those production areas. We want to be adding to those areas that can't be farmed for those purposes. Food on the productive land and fibre on the unproductive land. You know what we do with the waste product? Squeeze it, squeeze the juice out and turn it into beer. Here we go, it's a Kiwi Fire beer. How do you keep pale ale with? <laughs> if a huge international producer said, okay, we'll take it, you're on, what would happen? Do you, can you, you guys meet a market yet? I'm going to start off with a quote. Yeah. Bite off more than you can chew and then chew like fuck. <laughs> That's what we're all about. Are we, like over the past you know, year and so, we've, we've figured out how to scale so we know how to scale to the required amounts of these big companies. Do you? Yeah. So do you reckon those boys might make use of it? Well, we're hoping so. Our aim as a museum is to show people how it was done in the old days, but our second objective is to see the use of the Harakiki plant. So we know it needs a new modern uh, process, a new modern uses, and of, we would like to think it's going to be a high value product. Eventually it'll be tens of thousands of tonnes a month that are being harvested and processed and turned into high value products for international markets and that requires a fully fledged industry in New Zealand that's contributing to hundreds of thousands of jobs, prospering um, regions, communities, boosting the Māori economy, like the, the, the flow on effects are ridiculous. You're not ambitious are you? Mm, nah. <laughs> <laughs>